yes, the, the question was about the rotating detonations. Uh, so, of course, you know that uh, detonations are very different from the standard combustion problems that we have here. But there is a little bit of similarity of the, uh, the this acoustic modes and uh, and the the these detonations which uh, propagate uh, azimuthally. So you can use some sort of analogy, but not more. I don't think uh, it's it's a different problem. It's uh, so there is of course interest in these uh, rotating detonations. Yes. Okay. So let's uh, continue now, and uh, you see the, uh, the idea here is to use, uh, instead of using the swirler, uh, we use now these matrix uh, burners. This allows you to better understand what determines the structure of these azimuthal modes. Uh, and um, the flames are simpler. We know the, the, the FDF of these flames. And, uh, and so th the flow is laminar in, this, uh, in these burners. So th that's uh, something to, to look at. And uh, so this is how the chamber looks like now. Uh, the cylindrical walls, uh, we have these uh, injectors. The plenum is the same. We have the orifices which allow uh, pressure records on the chamber. And uh, in fact, the microphones are not set here. They're set as waveguide microphones. So it's a waveguide and the microphone is down and placed perpendicular to the waveguide. And this waveguide actually terminates with 25 meters of, uh, of flexible uh, tube. Like that, the waves which enter the waveguide are lost in the tube and the microphone just senses the pressure at the same value, but with a shift in uh, a delay corresponding to the propagation from the, from the pressure tap to the microphone. Uh, so this is the setup. For example, here we have a, uh, a chamber which has a, a smaller uh, length, L is equal to 0.2 meters. The camera is here. These are the injectors. Uh, we have numbered the microphone, the, the positions of these injectors. So one and nine are here aligned with the camera. And we have also microphones on the plenum. And, uh, and so when you, when you map this system, this is just a rather crude map. We, uh, I'll show a, a more elaborate one. In fact, you can find axial oscillations. You can find a standing mode right here, which looks like this one here. Uh, and you can find spinning modes here at about the same frequency, but these are spinning here. And then there is a, another special case, which is what we call the slanted mode, uh, inclined, slanted. And so uh, there is a variety of, uh, of uh, dynamics here. And we started studying that and gave papers of, uh, at these conferences. Um, perhaps this work, no, we'll see them. So um, let's, let's look uh, first at the standing mode. And uh, this might operate, perhaps, no. So the, um, uh, when, when the, the device operates, you can see that uh, in certain cases, the nodal line, so this is the pressure nodal line, is located like that. And when you restart the experiment, the nodal line will be like that. But, uh, but the mode then is uh, steady. You, you can see it uh, in a steady fashion. And uh, you can see a difference between the flames you see here close to the nodal line where the pressure has the lowest fluctuation. Uh, all the flames, they, they move, but not by much. You see, the, there, is a, there is a motion here. We will see that in detail. When you look at the flames, which are at the highest values of the pressure fluctuation, uh, the motion is much more intense right here. 
the motion here is much more intense than it is here. And this is the other way around. You see here the flames have a, are elongated uh, strongly here, uh, while here they, they are not, the motion is much smaller. And in addition, some of the periphery is, uh, is eliminated. You see, so the flames are, uh, this is, uh, the diameter is, is somewhat smaller here. So some of the, the fresh gases are burnt uh, later, right here. And uh, yeah, this is this standing mode. And, uh, and now uh, it's quite clean. You see, it's like uh, red lights getting into yellow lights. So when you, when you are yellow, it's, uh, it's strong. When you are red, it's small. And, and it goes from one, one place to the other. So these are phase, phase average of the oscillations uh, of the, uh, used by using this high-speed camera and phase averaging the data. Images are plotted in false color. It's just to improve uh, the, uh, the visibility. And uh, this is what you have close to the nodal line. So you see all the flames are here. There is a little bit of motion. Uh, so they, uh, they, they do sense the, the, the mode here, but they are close to, uh, this is close to, um, a very small uh, pressure fluctuation here. This whole thing takes place around 500, 490 hertz, let's say. So this is just by placing the camera close to one of these uh, injectors. And uh, we move now at a place where we are essentially at 90 degrees from the nodal line, and you see that the flames have a much larger motion, and you have this mechanism that we've seen previously, which happens, uh, where, you, where you have pulses of uh, heat release here. And this is what happens at that point here. Why is that so? Because here, uh, due to this very strong pressure fluctuations, you have also uh, strong uh, velocity fluctuations, which will uh, um, impact, influence the flames, and they produce this elongation. And then we can look at, uh, at a point right here, and we see that uh, at these points, uh, there is a, a good uh, response, and you have even, it looks like an, an even larger uh, level of oscillation. So while this morning I thought maybe we, we took this for that and that for this, I don't know. Perhaps there is a, just a, a mix of the, of the data. But anyway, what we see is that as you go away from the nodal line, you have a, uh, a very large response of the flames. Uh, what about the signals? Well, when you look at the signals of photomultiplier, and the microphone, you have P4 is here, and the photomultiplier is here. So this looks like in a textbook. You, you are in phase for the pressure and heat release. And uh, not quite, but almost. And uh, in addition, uh, you have also the, uh, the harmonic. And when you look at the harmonic, it's also in phase. So not only the, the fundamental is in phase, but the harmonic is also in phase. Uh, actually, uh, Daniel Durox uh, made this film to, to show all the, um, all the possibilities that we have here. So here is the combustor. Now, now it, it's ignited with the, uh, with the spark that is produced by this device here. And then we take it out so that everything is really perfectly <laughs> symmetric. So there is no more uh, protruding. Uh, spark uh, ignition. So this is the noise it makes. I'll put... Uh, so, so this is a spinning mode. So you see the spinning taking place very nicely. Then we'll see the, the standing. So 
So the frequency is this about 500 hertz. But it has harmonics. It's not a pure sound wave, a sinusoidal wave. So this is now standing. You see it sloshes from one side to the other. And this is the slanted mode. That's a little different. It's a so you see, it's like in a stadium when people stand up and yeah. We, we, we've been able to achieve that in, in our device. And so, uh, so we described this in, in some papers, the standing, the, the slanted uh, was in the last symposium. So this is a synthesis of these uh, various modes. Now, um, you can calculate using, uh, using a Helmholtz solver, you can actually calculate the modal shapes and uh, find out. So, so in fact, what drives this uh, instability here is a 0L, 1A plenum uh, mode. Essentially, you see in the chamber itself, the pressure is not very large. Uh, but, uh, but in this case, it's the plenum, which is the main uh, driver in terms of the resonance. And uh, what you see here is the, um, uh, th this, is, this is the 0L1A plenum mode at uh, this frequency. And this is the, uh, the first mode, 1L0A at this frequency here. Uh, in terms of signals, for the spinning mode, you have this beautiful uh, uh, signals at the microphones, as you would expect, and uh, in the chamber and in the plenum. In the plenum, you have about 200 pascals. In the chamber, you have about 60 pascals. Um, you can, uh, yeah, this just shows that there is a difference between the flames which are away from this nodal line and the flames that are close to the nodal lines. You see the their, their shape is different here. Uh, what, what we can do is also look at photomultiplier and microphone. So you can see this is the microphone and the photomultiplier is here. Uh, so, and then you have this one and the photomultiplier is here. So you see in this case, um, there is P prime and Q prime are not quite in phase because this system is not uh, very strongly damped. And as a consequence, the, uh, uh, you do have a source of sound. P prime, Q prime produce some uh, positive values, but uh, less than expected because probably the damping is lower. And, um, and so uh, this is why the, the pressure and the, uh, and, the, and the heat release are not quite in phase. Okay, so this is the spinning mode, just repeat it. Now, wh what's uh, interesting in the spinning mode uh, is, uh, we were surprised by that, it's the, the fact that when you plot uh, the position of the nodal line inside the chamber and inside the plenum, they are not aligned. In fact, there is an angle between both. There is an angle, you know, this nodal line uh, moves around, but uh, in the plenum, it, it is at a distance from this one. Uh, in acoustics, you don't have that. You, this, uh, the nodal line would be the same in the two cavities, but here, between the acoustics, you have combustion, and uh, there is an explanation of this angular shift, uh, which can be uh, given in terms of the, um, no, there is no tomorrow lecture. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> no, it wasn't, but uh, it comes from uh, some other slide. So uh, tomorrow, we don't see each other. <laughs> tomorrow, I fly back. <laughs> so unfortunately. All the good things have an end. That's, uh, that's how it is. So now there is this shift. The shift is uh, related to 
to this um, to, to combustion, which has a, a time delay, and there is a, an explanation of that in the paper with uh, Jean-François Bourgoin that was published in the Journal of Engineering for Gas Turbines and Power. So the, uh, now the slant and mode, this also is quite interesting. Uh, we, we were quite surprised to see that. It's a combination of two modes actually executing this motion. And uh, what happens is that this sort of uh, behavior produces a, a wave in terms of, you see, for example, the light intensity. You see at the various positions, you see that the light intensity has the shape of a wave like that. And uh, we, we, we thought how, how that can happen. Why, why does it have this sort of shape? And the idea is as follows. The, the, uh, the response of the flames at various levels of fluctuation is in fact um, changes with the level of fluctuation. You have this FDF. And in fact, the phase that you get as you change the level of fluctuation also changes. And, and this is why at certain places where you have higher velocities, you have this phase shift and uh, this phase shift will be reflected in your heat release fluctuations. So the, uh, it is possible to use this data. You see this, this is the phase. You, you also use the, uh, the data in terms of gain uh, right here. And taking into account the velocity fluctuations that are imposed by your mode. And using the transfer function, the describing function here, it is possible to build heat release fluctuations, which have exactly this shape of a wave. So here again, it's not perfect. You see, this doesn't exactly match that, but not much. Uh, you, you, you do have this sort of wave-like behavior of the, of the heat release. So this explains this slanted behavior. All right, these are a few summary points for all that, but uh, okay, let's pass that. And uh, the last minutes, perhaps we can spend by looking at uh, computational flame dynamics. You, you know, the, this is the, the modern fluid dynamics, the CFD now for combustion, because now we calculate flames which move around. It's really flame dynamics and uh, it's computational. So uh, just a, a small run through that. And uh, so, so basically uh, CFD started uh, in the 1960s uh, because pre before that uh, the computers that were available were quite, uh, quite limited. Nevertheless, they were used for various applications. But uh, during the 1960s, uh, uh, the, the algorithms started being developed. What is shown here in, in violet is my own uh, research career. So it, it became, it, it began uh, perhaps a little, just a little later from that on. But uh, so, so, so this is just my own uh, subjectivity. So then numerical combustion is, uh, it took some time to do calculations of flames. For example, some of the early calculation by Dixon Lewis of uh, very simple flames, plain flames, um, using complex chemistry. Uh, in the 1970s, the, the only flame structures that were calculated were, were rather simple, hydrogen, air. Uh, even that was complicated. Uh, also, very simple chemistry were calculated. Uh, uh, but basically using uh, theoretical uh, analysis, for example, matched asymptotic expansions, uh, act, uh, large activation energy asymptotics, activation energy asymptotics. And, uh, and also uh, some, some uh, turbulent combustion uh, done using RANS, all of that began in the 1970s. 
Uh, now the new CFD starts later. Uh, for example, we did the calculation of a vortex uh, rolling up a flame. So this, this produces a core in the vortex. This is a problem that Frank Marble had uh, done analytically and uh, he told me about it and I said I'm, I'm going to do that numerically. And, uh, and so we used the, the uh, mixture fraction equation because here you can study that using the mixture fraction and you put a vortex and, uh, and you can actually look at the vortex roll up. And what is interesting is that the sheets, the flame sheets interact between themselves and form this core of burned products in the center of the vortex. Uh, around uh, 1990, Thierry Poinceau was doing uh, some very nice DNS calculations. He, he's, uh, he has had uh, a, a very strong influence on the development of DNS. Uh, at that time, he, was, uh, he had finished his thesis and was at Stanford and, uh, and exposed to, uh, to work of Sanjeeva Lele, who was uh, using uh, high precision techniques to calculate uh, uh, turbulent flows. And uh, they developed also the boundary conditions uh, for the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, non-reflecting boundary conditions. So this is a, an ignition, for example, in turbulence. So you can see the flame being, uh, this is two-dimensional turbulence, not yet fully three-dimensional. And, uh, and so, at first, most of the uh, calculations were done using Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations. So these are the calculations that you do on complex devices. DNS started in the 1990s, uh, uh, and where you look at all the scales, time and spatial scales, and uh, larger dissimulation appeared around 1990. Uh, if you look at, uh, if you uh, give the two keywords, I'll show that diagram in, uh, uh, later, you put larger dissimulation and, uh, and combustion. Uh, for these two keywords, you definitely see that there are no papers or very few uh, before 1990. And then, of course, it, it grows. And uh, this, is, uh, this shows a little bit of this history. So for example, in 1954, uh, Carmen and Penner were very happy to be able to calculate analytically with 15 pages of uh, equations, uh, the ozone decomposition flame. Not a, not a flame of a very high value, but uh, it's a two-step flame and they gave the the burning velocity of this, uh, this flame and uh, used uh, a chain reaction and they were indicating that the same method could be used for more complicated chemistry in the future. But uh, if it had to be done analytically, that would be, have been very difficult. So uh, numerical calculations, of course, were, were, in, uh, were needed. Uh, then we, uh, we did this flame vortex calculations. These are some of the first uh, detailed uh, structures, flames which are rolled up in a vortex, uh, premixed and non-premixed. Uh, th there are uh, a lot of work has been done on, uh, uh, on counterflow flames. For example, this morning I, I was, uh, after a question of, uh, uh, one of you, uh, I was explaining what happens to this extinction curve uh, as you change the temperature of one of the reactants. You see you have this S-shaped curve here. This, this is around 1988. And uh, as you change the temperature, this, this curve uh, changes. And uh, at a point, you don't have any more ignition. You just have a continuous curve right here. Uh, Reynolds average simulations of turbulent ducted flames were made around these times. This is a direct simulation. Uh, we, we started doing larger dissimulations uh, around this area, year. There were a few earlier. For example, Shuresh Menon had done some very nice work on ramjets uh, instabilities using the G equation and the combination of the G equation and uh, and um, turbulent uh, flows. Uh, we studied flashback using uh, flame thickening here in 1980. 
and then uh, some, uh, some uh, preliminary calculations of uh, uh, swirling uh, flames uh, stabilized uh, in this cylindrical box. And then you get to these calculations of uh, ignition here. There is a parallel development in IC engines. People are actually calculating cycle to cycle variations uh, in IC engines here. And, uh, and, and now in two, 2010, we, we were able, and there, there, there has been previous work of Vigor Yang and uh, Joe F. Line, but uh, now we calculate transcritical combustion and compare that with uh, experiments. And, and you see here now it's uh, instabilities calculated. Uh, these are calculations of uh, multiple cryogenic jets submitted to transverse oscillations. This is the ignition that I've shown in 2013. And there is a recent paper in, in combustion and flame where we study uh, the combustion instability triggered in a full rocket engine. So this is an engine that operates at DLR and you have a, a dome and the chamber and the nozzle, 42 injectors. So uh, you need a, a, a very big grid to do that. This is 10 centimeter or a little less in diameter. And uh, in, there is a case where this becomes unstable and there is a case where this is stable. And uh, by doing what, what is described in this paper, we can actually demonstrate that uh, we can retrieve this behavior. So, so now calculations are able to cope with the rather complicated <coughs> configurations of that kind. So uh, more and more, except that uh, it requires a lot of work. It's not, uh, this was done by uh, uh, Anna Federica Urbano. She, she was a postdoc in Toulouse and uh, we, we worked together with her and uh, Thomas Schmidt and uh, other people, Laurent Sell. And, and this, is, this is a pretty nice calculation. It's very hard, very difficult to, to have because it, this is, uh, turbulent, supercritical, transcritical. Uh, there is uh, instability here. And uh, so you have all the complexities at once. And then you have a, a geometrical complexity because you want to represent the modes, the, the, the dome and the chamber and so on. So this is just to show what, what, you, what you see in terms of uh, LES and you see now that uh, uh, the level of, the number of papers that have these two keywords. Some of them are, are not of very high quality anyway, but uh, not everything is, uh, is fine here. But you see that uh, there is a trend in developing LES. Uh, now, now why, why we develop LES? This is a question that was asked before. And the, the reason is that DNS, when for DNS you need to, to use uh, a grid and uh, you have to re represent the whole turbulence. So what is the condition? You, you need at least to have a dimension which is greater than the large scale of turbulence, let's say this large scale. And delta X has to be at least of the order of the Kolmogorov scale. And as a consequence, the number of grid points in one direction is like Reynolds to the three quarters because you use the scaling of the Kolmogorov cascade. Then you have here another condition which is important is that the flame itself has to be resolved with n points. And after some calculations, you get n, big N over small n square greater than Reynolds times Damkeller. And so you have these two limitations. And uh, for example, if you, if you have a billion points, you access perhaps to a Reynolds number of 10 to the four, but then it's bad because the, the dam color will be essentially uh, less than one and th that's not combustion really. So, uh, so in fact, you have to limit your Reynolds number to get a dam color number of greater value. Here I took N is equal to 20 here. 20 points in the flame to resolve the flame. If you don't resolve the flame, it's, uh, it doesn't work because you don't get the right, uh, the right uh, um, uh, reaction rates, for example. So, so you see a big limitation on DNS. 
But nevertheless, people are quite courageous and do larger and larger calculations using DNS. You have this diagram, uh, and in this diagram, you think you, you want to know where, what, what is accessible to, uh, to uh, DNS. So the, this diagram was introduced by Marcel Barrère, and later on uh, improved by Borghi, and later on by Foreman Williams and Norbert Peters and others. So you have uh, L over delta. This is the length of the turbulence. This is the flame thickness. And here you have U over SL. This is the fluctuation at the large scale divided by the burning velocity. And in this diagram, you recognize lines of uh, damp color is equal to 1, 10, 100. Reynolds numbers, uh, uh, constant lines are like that. And uh, we, we did a lot of um, calc well, at first it was thought that this limit here, the Klimov williams limit, was, uh, was separating flames which are here essentially wrinkled or flamelets from flames which are thickened and uh, for, from stirred reactors or something here. But, uh, but doing DNS and some uh, analysis, you find that this limit here uh, is not the right one because it was thought that the Kolmogorov uh, vortices were extinguishing the flame as soon as they entered the flame. But these vortices only, uh, their time scale is inversely proportional to their strain rate. The strain rate is very high, by the, but the time scale is very short and they are dissipated very rapidly. As a consequence, uh, this, this is probably not where the quenching takes place. And according to us, it's much higher here. Uh, so that here you have essentially flame, uh, flamelet regimes. So then you, you can do some calculations. I've shown already this one. This is the using DNS, you can calculate uh, such flames. So this is the, uh, the flame interacting with the um, with equivalence ratio fluctuations. That's useful. And I told you that this produces very strong changes in the velocity. So if you do a theory, you, you can use that uh, because it, it shows that you have to account for this phenomenon. Uh, we've done also calculations of the V flame impinged by this, uh, uh, this um, equivalence ratio perturbations. Uh, we've done these uh, flames as well. So, yeah, in, uh, in general, one thinks that uh, LES will be able to cope with all these difficult problems, full combustors, uh, full uh, engines like that. Here you have 500 injectors. So uh, it will still require a, a little more uh, computer resources. Uh, ignition engines uh, are quite uh, tractable using LES, except that you have a variable geometry, uh, complex shapes, uh, complex <laughs> injection situations. Gas turbines are also amenable to LES. Again, the idea is that uh, in direct simulation, you try to represent all scales, but that's too much. And, uh, and so this, this is a good idea to model the small scales and just keep the large scales. And uh, what are the, the possibility? One difficulty in LES is to represent actually the, the flame on the grid because the grid is too coarse for the flame. And there are two ideas here. One of them is to take the flame. So the flame is not resolved on the grid. So one, one way is to replace it by a thin front and, and describe the flame using the G equation. So this is one way to do it. The other one is to use an idea that was initiated in Princeton, in fact, by Bracco and um, O'Rourke. So uh, that's, uh, that's an idea that came here, but not in the context of LES. They explained in one paper that you can thicken the flame and keep the, the velocity constant. It's rather easy to show. Uh, so uh, in essence, you multiply the diffusion 
coefficients by a certain factor and um, you divide the reaction rate by the same factor. This increases the thickness by this factor and it, uh, it keeps the velocity constant. So that, that's another possibility. Then you have another idea is to filter the flame, so a number of things. But there are many more ideas, uh, some more complicated, some whatever. And uh, th this uh, flame thickening is uh, demonstrated, for example, in these fl flashback studies that we, we began here. And you can see that the flames, uh, this is a backward facing step and these flames are, can flash back and you can see flashback due to uh, oscillations inside here. So this is Braco and Oru. And then we, we, we began, the, and, and a lot has been done on that. For example, this is calculated using this uh, thickening techniques. So you see here the temperature uh, on the upper side and on the lower side you see the, uh, the heat release in, the, in this uh, combustor. And uh, I've shown these calculations and I've shown that. So these are some recent uh, publications uh, that we have uh, that you can uh, look at. It's a lot of literature. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, uh, there are many things that I haven't uh, uh, presented here, um, uh, which, uh, which, are, uh, uh, which are there. For example, there is a, we were able uh, we had some students in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a high school and they developed for us a, a swirler with variable uh, angle for the blades. The, the, the stagger angle could be varied continuously using a small motor. And like that we could change the swell number and see how that affects instabilities. And this is, this is explained in for example, this one was not accepted for the, pro, uh, for the symposium, but is in combustion and flame. People didn't feel it was sufficiently original, so you can see that, uh, but nevertheless, it's there. So, um, uh, there is another one which, which is uh, interesting, it's the, um, this, this is the recent one. Uh, now we have, um, we have a, a paper except I'll give you a few slides of that. This a hysteresis phenomenon leading to spinning or standing azimuthal instabilities. I have just a few slides from that. And uh, one thing w which is also interesting is that uh, when the flames are interacting in this azimuthal situation, sometimes you have different frame, flame shapes and uh, alternating patterns of flame shapes uh, in the steady state. So instead of having the same flames, you have one flame which is M-like and one which is V-like, M-like, V-like, and so on. So that's unusual and it's reported in this, in this paper here. So let's go, uh, yeah, let me show also the, uh, uh, this, this is uh, also another uh, paper in which we studied the relation between the PVC, you know the PVC is the precessing vortex core. Somebody uh, asked me about its relation with uh, all that. And when you have a PVC and you often have the PVC in swirling flows, you need a certain level of swirl. Uh, you can find that, uh, that frequency in your flow. So this is the hydrodynamic frequency of the PVC. So for example, for this swirler, you have 750 Hertz. And then you put in an acoustic wave. So you see the acoustic wave. And you can find uh, the difference between the PVC frequency and the acoustic wave coming into the picture. So by nonlinear interaction inside this flow, you get this uh, and this, this is a very large uh, effect here. So, um, so, so that's, uh, 
that's in, and this can happen either by forcing, so you can have forcing, but you can also have that uh, with, a, with a, an acoustic instability, then you get the sum and the difference uh, obtained like that. And uh, when you look at the pattern that is obtained at that uh, frequency by a special technique that was developed by Jonas Moek, you can find this yin-yang sort of pattern. So combustion producing, produces yin-yang patterns. That's uh, another feature of combustion. And so that's finished here. And let me show you this, a few slides about this, uh, this last uh, topic. So this, this is a, uh, as I told you, it's, it's a hysteresis phenomenon that we, we have. And uh, this is work that, that is now accepted for combustion and flame. So uh, the, uh, the, the question here is, uh, can you get spinning standing modes at the same place? Or is it really either one? one or the other. We've seen that in some cases you have switching between spinning and, sk and, and standing modes. But uh, we haven't seen a case where you can have one and by doing something different, you, you, you can have the other one. And this is what is shown here. So you have again this combustor with uh, matrix injectors. And uh, when we started uh, scanning the, this uh, the, this device a little more carefully, we get a region where you, first of all, you get a longitudinal mode around here. Then you get spinning modes in this region here. When you are here, you get standing modes. And then in between, you have an overlap. And depending on the, the way that you go into this region, so we called it a dual mode because you get either a standing or a spinning. If you come from above here, you get a standing mode. If you, come, if you come from below here, you get a spinning mode. So uh, this just shows the spinning mode. This shows the standing mode. And, uh, and what actually, you, have a, you, you can uh, draw hysteresis loops uh, in, in, the, in this diagram. If you are here, you see you are, this is a chugging mode and that you get a spinning mode as you increase phi. So at that point, the frequency is about here, and here is a spinning. And then you continue here, you're spinning, and then you go to this point, and now you come back this way, and here, for the same equivalence ratio, you have kept the, the velocity constant, and here you get a standing mode. And then you get back here, of course, the, the frequencies do not quite match. First of all, here, the frequencies are not exactly the same. Uh, it, there is a, a small difference here. Well, one would expect exactly the same frequencies from theory, but not, it's not the case here because the combustion is slightly different. So the frequency is, is, is different. But for the same conditions, you can get either a spinning or a standing depending on the way, on the history. So, and then what, what you find, which is interesting, is that before you get this spinning mode, so what is plotted here is two microphones which are at 90 degrees apart. If you have a spinning mode, you will get something round. Before you get that, you can see that the trajectories of these two microphones do something which look like, uh, like a cloud like that. And suddenly, as you enter the region of this, uh, dual mode region, you get this behavior here. On the other hand, when you are uh, uh, at high values of uh, equivalence ratio and you go down, you have something which looks much more on the, which is around the, the diagonal. And here you get uh, uh, the, the standing mode in this case, instead of getting uh, this. So, so you see you have some precursor telling you 
that uh, what you will get in the end will be a standing mode, while here you have something like that, which will tell you that later you get a spinning mode. So you know that you have this, this uh, possibility, and by watching the trajectories, you can already say, oh, this will become a spinning mode, or this will become a standing mode. So, yeah, so that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say. So that's it, I, I've done it. I've covered all the material, more or less. <laughs> so uh, it's up to you to, to integrate all that, to, to get advantage of what you've learned. So are there any final questions or comments or remarks that you want to make? Hybrid LES. This is combining RANs and LES. So yes, one of the ideas is that certain regions do not deserve to be calculated with LES. Like that, you you can uh, win some uh, computational time, and um, you, the, the problem is matching between these regions. That's one problem. Uh, the other one is in the regions where you do not use LES. <coughs> you put viscosity which can be rather large and this may damp uh, oscillations. So in applications of this kind, it might uh, bring in a lot of damping and uh, then you won't see the, the instability coming up. So uh, it's, uh, you, you see LES has a very small viscosity level. So it's much smaller because it's uh, commensurate with the the, the size of the cells, so this is small. It's uh, as you improve actually your grids, uh, the, the gridding, you get even lesser uh, viscosity. So that's a difficulty of LES because as you have less viscosity, it's more sensitive to, so uh, if it's too robust, it means that you have too much viscosity. So this is uh, always a, a trade-off between, between this and that. And it's important to, re to increase the number of cell sizes, the, the number of cells. Yes, yeah. So uh, is there any attempt to use instabilities in a constructive way? Yes, for quite a while, people have been interested in enhancing heat transfer uh, in so-called pulse combustors. So these have uh, been used, for example, for agricultural applications to enhance the transfer because when you are in the non-steady state, uh, you improve the the transfer of heat uh, with respect to something that you want to, for example, you want to eliminate the water out of uh, a product or to reduce the humidity. And uh, for that, you can use pulse combustors. So there was a lot of work on pulse combustors, especially at Georgia Tech. Uh, uh, Benzene has done a lot of work on that uh, for a while. Uh, but Usually this, this is more something that you want to eliminate than one, so something that you want to, uh, to, uh, to use. But for that application, and I think there are devices like that, that operates in the, in the pulsed mode. There, there have been meetings uh, on the pulse combustors. For example, I attended a meeting like that in, in Monterey uh, in 1990 or something around that period organized by uh, Sandia. Sandia was also working on in this field. All right, so that's it. Uh, now we, it's lunch. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It, it, again, it, it, was a, it was a pleasure to, to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Thanks.